Last year was pretty dismal. So this port is where I started offshore fishing. I was 13 years old. Fished with my grandparents, salmon fishing, and a 17-foot dorsal. Yeah, that's how many years ago that was. But, and we went offshore, and the swells were big, and my eyes were about that big as well, and had some great times, and learned a lot. Knowing what I know about the ocean today, I'm not sure I would have went offshore in some of these. My grandparents went offshore. Amen. So, but they seem to be able to find their way back and, and catch fish, so... Um, I run a 34-foot hydrosport, triple 300s on the back, smoothest riding boat, best handling boat I've ever owned. And I've owned quite a few, quite a few aluminum, quite a few fiberglass boats. One of the things that makes this a nice riding boat is, is the fact that the helm and the seating is towards the back of the boat. One of the things you should know about your boat is, is the smoothest spot in your boat is going to be at the back. I was running offshore one day listening to the radio and there was an aluminum jet sled running offshore and they had metal jeep cans with gasoline strapped to the bow of their boat. Boom, 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 boom. Off sure they'd go and about every 20 minutes they'd call their buddy boat and tell them they got to stop so they could restrap them off. Okay? There's a lot that's wrong with that picture. First, you got the jerry cans in the front. Second, you're in a jet sled that is burning a ton of fuel running offshore. And one of the things you need to know is how much your fuel burning is on your boat. And you should have a third for going out, a third for coming back, and a third for just a safe margin in case the ocean drips up and gets nasty. So, I have 600 miles of range of that boat. Got a big fuel tank. It'll uh, hurt your credit card at the dock, and, and uh, we won't talk about that part of it. I am sponsored by quite a few people. I used to run charter for well over 25 years, and when I quit running charter, I thought I was going to lose my sponsors. But the fact that I gave so many seminars, they all I had more sem more sponsors now than I did before. So they want me to promote their product. So. Albacore are highly migratory, and our albacore come across the ocean somewhere slightly north of the Bay Area. And they're in a counterclockwise rotation. Okay? They're going to migrate up the coast, up into Brit British Columbia, off Vancouver Island, where they do catch them there, and on up to southeast Alaska. And some years, the guys out of Sitka will fish for them a little bit. And then on around, they'll come. When they get to be mature albacore, they'll move into the South Pacific where they spawn when they're five to seven year old fish. Okay? Sometimes a big eye and a small bluefin will come with them. So, last couple of years we've been getting some of the bigger bluefin. But uh, the guys in San Diego, when you hear them talking on the chat forums and different things, hey, the fish are in, those fish are never coming up here. They have a clockwise rotation. Their fish come across, move down the coast and do a different, totally different migration than what we have. So, some of their yellow, yellowtail, dorado, and marlin will make it up into our waters when the waters get warm enough in September and October. So last year there was a couple of marlin caught. So, they're three to four year old fish. They're immature. One of the things you hear people talk about is you shouldn't eat tuna if you're pregnant. These are immature fish. Oregon State's done studies on them, and the mercury count in these fish is extremely low. Okay? So when you hear that talk, they're not talking about these fish. <coughs> Mature ones, 75 to 100 pounds. They don't have a bladder. They're constantly swimming. They'll coast down, they'll swim up. Coast down, swim up. They've tagged them and they've learned that an albacore will travel down and up 24 times in a 24 hour period. Okay? Feeding machines. 
You get them in a feeding frenzy, they'll eat 25% of their body weight in a day. Okay, that's a lot. Or again, 25 fish per person. One of the things I tell people, when you're new at tuna fishing, it's easy to catch as many as you can catch. Go home and worry about trying to take care of all those fish. <laughs> we took a couple guys offshore one day. The guy that owns the company that does my, all my embroidery work. And they weren't tuna fishermen. We're running offshore in the fog. We get out there. We stop. Start fishing. We get a couple of fish. It's not going hot and heavy. Real not. Why are we catching fish? It's like, nah, it's not fast enough. We move about a mile, fish jumps. I stop right on him, throw some more chum. The girls, wetty drops some iron. They go to back to live bait And the next thing you know, they have 54 fish. And I'm telling them, it's like when that bleed bucket's full, you gotta stop. And they're just stuffing that thing. Oh, we get one more. And it's like, don't put, any, don't put anything overboard. It took them three days. <laughs> they were complaining about it on the fourth day to process those fish. It's easy to get wrapped up in catching a lot of fish. It's fun, it's exciting. But after a while, it's like, what are you going to do with all that fish? So when we run offshore now, if you're fishing with me, I'll ask you, how many fish do you want? How many do you want? How many do you want? And we try to stop at that. And some days, we get a little bit over that. We get hot and heavy. Other days, we do get it stopped. So it's kind of hard to stop sometimes when they're chewing the paint off the bottom of the boat and you're all excited and it's, I mean they're coming over the rail as fast as you can get them. But I would encourage you to practice that. So food is the key to locating albacore. Food's the key to locating tuna, period. I fish the giant bluefin on, back on the East Coast every other year. And the one thing about a giant bluefin, it's the only species that can regulate its own body temperature. A bluefin doesn't care what the water temperature is. I've caught them in 18 feet of water where it was 49 degrees, right off from me to the beach, right here. From here to the door, off the beach. Big fish, that close. Three hours later, the 72 degree water and 6,000 feet of water. And for all you guys that think you catch big fish, and, and a bluefin does not run down. He runs out when you catch him. So if you think you're gonna get spooled, yeah, you have a good chance of that. But if you hook a big fish and he's running, he's probably gonna run out. And if you back the drag off, and put your thumb on a little bit, he'll stop. Now you've got a chance of getting it. Move the boat, gain some ground, reeling back up a little bit. <coughs> food is the key. Think about food. Water temperature is number two. 58 to 62 degrees is typically what we prefer. When we get into 63 and 64 degree water, they go down. You're going to find them in a thermocline, 40 to 70 feet down. Okay? And a lot of times you trawl all day and not touch a fish. So you got to be able to figure out how to go down and get them. And we'll cover that. But when I'm looking at where I'm going to go offshore, that's one thing I look at is water temperature. Okay? When you run offshore, most of the time you're looking for birds. Birds sit on the water, may have already fed. Slicks, a giant blue, bluefin travel in big schools. And when you come across where they have fed, it'll be, look like an oil slick out on the water. And it'll smell like hens. I mean, it's, I've seen slicks five, five miles square on this coast. Huge schools. Our albacore travel pretty much in big schools. You find one, typically there's many. Fish jumping, when the water 
A lot of times in, the, in August and September, you'll see a jumper. Great indication there's fish there. Commercial boat. Those guys fish for a living. And they don't fish where there's not fish. Most of the time. Okay? Just be careful and don't get in their way. Because a lot of times they're on autopilot and they may not see you and they'll run right over you. So. You're looking for a blue water or green water break? Sometimes you'll find a real dramatic one where there's just, you go from blue to green. Most of the time it's a transition. You'll be in green, clean water right on the edge of a transition into blue. Good spot most of the time. Or the rips, if you can find them. If you're traveling um, with a couple of buddies, covering some water, talking on the radio, help each other out. Out here, it's amazing how many people talk in code. They don't want anybody to know where they're at. <laughs> I don't care if you know where I'm at. So, help each other out. Make sure you're fishing in an area that has fish. You look on my chart plotter, I've got waypoints where I've caught fish. Okay? And then I hear a report that, oh man, they killed them yesterday over here, da 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 da. It's like, yeah, that's not really a place where I've caught fish before. So I got talked into one of those one time. One of my crew members, he had some buddies from work he wanted to take him fishing. And it was a hot bike. All right, we'll go out there and try that. So we go to this spot, we try it. A lot of boats heard the same report. We're all out there, we're all trolling around. Nobody's catching fish. They're all on the radio. And when you're on the radio, that means you're not catching fish. Because if you're catching fish, you don't have time to be on the radio. Trawling, change directions, change gear, change speed. I mean, a number of changes. And after two hours of that, it's real amount. And I ran 20 miles to the south where I'd caught fish four days earlier. And I was the only boat down there. Put the gear in the water, went to trolling, boom, caught the first one within 20 seconds of gear being in the water. And back and forth, 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 back and forth. The rest of the day right there. We got back, we were high boat for the whole fleet. And we barely had 21, 22 fish. A lot of people stayed in that same spot all day. Don't be afraid to go find your own spot. So, reliable is the key there on reports. Remember, they're highly migratory. They could have came through, hot bite, somebody stumbled across it. It was hot for the day and it's not for the next. If you don't have any birds, no sea jumper, you haven't had a temperature break, or there's no sea life, chances are there's no tuna there either. If it's a barren ocean, there's not even a bird, twitty bird sitting on the water, there's probably no tuna there. Okay? Because normally if there's sea life around, you've got a better shot. And then did you check the sea surface and chlorophyll charts before you left? I ran offshore one time. My crew was uh, late getting there. We didn't get off the dock till like 8.30. We're headed to where there was a reliable report. But everybody had the reliable report. We're passing, I mean, boats fast, we're passing boats on the way out. We get out there, and it almost looked like that. Well, I can tell you if, it, if there's a lot of boats out there, and most of them are trolling, very few people are going to catch fish. Because all that boat traveling through the water is going to drive them down. Okay? So if you're in that big group that's trolling around out there, there's a good chance if you're trolling, you're probably not going to catch fish. Now, I went to the edge of that, pulled the throttles back, looked on the sonar, there was fish down there 40, 50 feet. We dropped iron down to them, hooked them up. We were catching fish. 
boat came by me from me to that door, this door. That's how close they were. Lost her body. I saw that boat at the big dock. <laughs> Lost her body. Dropped the iron back down, got him hooked up again, brought him back up, started. Yeah, boat comes by again. Lost her body. Yeah. So you have a choice. You can either get angry or get used to it if you're going to stay there. You don't have a choice. Don't get angry. If you're going to get angry, you must leave. Go find your own hole. Okay? So we stayed and we kept dropping the iron, kept bringing them back, and we throw swim bait and a little live bait. And I mean, we caught a lot of fish. Lost a lot of fish, caught a lot of fish. I had a couple of young guys and they were having troubles with the rod, so we lost a few fish that way. But if you're going to fish in a crowd, then you got to get used to that. So, sea service temperature charts. You, should, you really should subscribe to some online service. This one happens to be terrifying. Now, when I'm looking the day before, I'm looking to see what the water temperature in the chlorophyll is. And one of the things I'm looking at, see this temperature grade right here? This is off the Columbia River, right there. There's Astoria Canyon. This is 124, 40, 46, 10. This area right in here, a little inside that, you can see it start, there's a pretty good little temperature transition right there, okay? But look at the temperature here. I'm going to work clear up to 64, 65, 66 degrees. This area is a real fishy area. Remember I said I have waypoints all over? A lot of times where you catch fish, you'll catch them again, then again, then again. And a lot of times you're going back to a similar spot. Same thing out here. I used to moor down here in Newport, so I used to fish tuna town a lot. I had a lot of waypoints out there. What this chart tells me, you see that water temperature? Remember what I said, when water temperature gets 63, 64, 65 degrees, they're going to go down. This chart shows me how I'm going to have to fish. I'm going to have to go down to get them. Okay? So now, unless you're prepared to fish iron or go down to get them, you better plan on fishing inside of this in the cooler water. And hopefully there's fish in there. Okay? Because if you fish in that warmer water, unless you know how to fish iron, it's going to be a slow day. Running and gunning for jumpers and swim baits could work for you, but it's still going to be a slow day. So here's the chlorophyll chart, so I'm going to look at that. Same area. That blue water transitions a little bit beyond it. Right in there. See that? And that is blue water, and this is green water. Okay. So this tells me if I want to fish this, this break. Get my remote to work here. I'm going to be right in here. That's where I'm going to probably pick a spot and go to. Okay. Sirius XM weather, and this is on my Garmin display, and I've set the temperature on it from about 57 up to about 64 degrees, 58 to 64 degrees, and let's see what that is. You can see where I fished a lot, okay? Also look, the water temperature is changing in here. Okay. One of the things I do in the morning is I'll look at that at the dock. I like to look offshore and see, has it changed? Okay. And I'll have that on all day long. And it'll change, continually change during the day. It'll update every three hours. One of the things you want to do though, if you have Sirius XM weather, is you 
want to check your sea surface temperature on your boat and make sure it's accurate. For a long time, with the Garmin, and, and, I, and I can speak to the other companies as well, when you do a software update, you need to check it. Because the, the Garmin's for a number of years, up until recently, every time you do the software update, it, cha it, it would change it. It would be off by two to three degrees. That isn't the case the last couple of years. I grumble enough, I guess they fixed it. But, you know, check it. It may be off if you've done a software update recently. Okay? Because one of the things that happens is you get out there and this temperature maybe, you put your finger on it, see where that little guy is? You put your finger on that and a number will come up, tell you what the temperature is right there. And it may not, and you might be sitting right there. And it may not match what's on your, your unit. And that's why. Okay? So calibrate it. Easy way to calibrate it, go buy a buoy that has uh, weather. Stop at the, right beside the buoy. Get on your phone, look to see what that buoy temperature is. And then look to see what your temperature is. Okay? Or you can get your device and just put it in the water, thermometer or something. But check it. Otherwise, it may be off. Cirrus XM with, tuna, or, uh, with uh, swell period and wind. The farther apart they are, the longer the swell, closer together. So now I have temperature and I've got swell with it. And I've got wind. And there's very little wind on that. Okay? Now I've had Sirius XM weather for a long time. I don't know how many years it's been out, but it's been a long time. Do you have to pay for that step Yes. Yes. Recently, Garmin and Sirius XM developed fish mapping. And I helped develop it for the West Coast, and I'm still working on it with them for the West Coast. Fish mapping is something a little bit different. You have to have a GXM 54 Garmin antenna to make it work with your display. And it'll give you fishing recommendations, sea surface temperature contours, plankton concentration contours, lead lines, sea surface temperature front strength, plankton front strength, sea height anomaly, and 30 meter subsurface sea temperatures. I only use three of those. The three I use that are the most important Plankton front strength, which is chlorophyll. Sea surface temperature front strength, because I'm looking for a temperature break. Okay? And then sea height anomaly. Why is that important? Because it tells me the elevation of the ocean. And anywhere there's water being pushed up, chances are there's bait being trapped there. And where the bait's being trapped, the tuna will congregate. Okay. This came out about three years ago. I'm going to move to... This is Sea Height Phenomenon. And this is off the, the East Coast. These numbers, I don't think you can read them. That's 1.93, 5.9, 13.7, 11.9, 13.7, 12.7. A negative number is a downwelling. You don't want to fish where there's a negative number because it's pushing everything down. There's no bait there. Okay. So here's my unit on the west coast. See my crumb trails? Okay. And I went in and I played with it a little bit. And I've got all these in a... Um, display and temperature. That's the height anomaly, plankton front strength, and the temperature front strength in red. Temperature red, plankton green, and the sea height anomalies in yellow. And let me get a better screen. Get my remote to work. There we go. Alright, same picture. There's temperature, there's plankton, see the green line? 
from there is the orange line, frequency height anomaly. So you, you find where the, the numbers on temperature fronts are in one to four, four being the strongest temperature break. Plankton, same thing, one to four. Four being the strongest plankton break. When we talk about a transition, we're looking for tra we're looking for that strong transition. And then where the sea height is being pushed up, hopefully you can get find a spot where these three all come together. Where maybe this is a three or a four, plankton three or four. So I touch the screen right here. Was it strong? So that's a strong place to fish. Okay. If those, if those numbers were higher than that, it'd say very strong. Lower than that, it'd say moderate. If it was a downwelling, it'd probably say poor. Okay. Touch that screen, it tells me what the longitude and latitude is of that spot right there. And it tells me how far that is from where I'm currently setting. And when I did this, I was setting at the dock in El Walk, 44.6 miles away. Okay. This is with a touch screen. Okay. The only three features I use of the fish map throughout here. On the East Coast, those three are also pretty important, but they also have fishing recommendations put on theirs. We don't have any fishing recommendations out here for any of that stuff. No. So you need the GXM 54 antenna. Now it is, it is on Simrad, it is on, um, it is now on Raymarine, but you have to do a software update with those and you probably have to put a different antenna on to receive it, so. Garmin helped develop it, I helped it develop it on the West Coast. You can um, run it six months out of the year and then turn it off. And I do have a flyer, since I'm working with Sirius XM, you get a month free, okay? You can also get the weather on the back of it. But it's $99 a month for six months, and you get the first month free, or if you don't want to activate it, turn it off. But uh, it's pretty slick. Because I go to my, my fish map in the morning before I leave the dock, confirm what I saw the day before, the night before, on my online stuff. Okay, and that will also update during the day as well on the fish map. Does that integrate right in with the Garmin existing system? Yes. All right. So this is my sonar. And this has been from a number of years ago. And I'm on low chirp. I used to talk about chirp frequencies and different things. One of the things I've learned is at low chirp, I can turn the gain up or down enough that I can see them. At high chirp, I can turn the gain up or down enough I can see them. Okay. The big thing is when I get offshore, I take my sonar off of auto and I put it on manual. I only want to see as deep as I can fish. So I'll take and put it on manual. Might put it down 100 feet. This one's down 70 feet. You can see the tuna on here. We have, they ran a wide open bite, and um, a lot of times they're streaking underneath here. It's rare to see them in an arch, just because they're moving so fast. And a lot of this is all tuna, just because they're moving so fast. They're only underneath that beam for a split second. A lot of times. You said tuna don't have air bladders. Yeah. Yeah, that's because uh, the sonar is looking for more things than an air bladder. Vertebrae, things like that. So, my temperature went out on that thing the other day. It was reading 105. It was up to like 130 by the end of the day. But, uh, so yeah. Hot tub water. Very much so. It was nice and warm out there, too. Pan optics. We put this on my boat a few years ago, and I didn't used to be a gizmo nut, still. But I tell you what, 
This has been a game changer for some days. Dropping the jig, see the fish coming up, wham, I took it right there. This is looking straight down. From my boat, you're looking at, this is a, actually a simulated picture here, it's not off my boat. Uh, this is about 15 feet over and about 28 feet down. We put pan optics on my boat five years ago, six years ago, something like that. I've only trolled three times in the last five or six years. No sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, fish mapping that I showed you. I use that to figure out where I'm going to go and I pick a spot. I run offshore out to that spot. I flip my screens around. I turn my pan optics on. And one of the ladies on my boat who's really good at iron will drop a jig down. Get both leaders with me. I'll have two people dropping iron. And we'll see that iron going down. Even if they don't take it, there will be a reaction. And you'll see that reaction. Found. Now, how do we get them to go? So we spend a little bit of time. Sometimes we get them to go right out of the gate. Other times it takes them a little bit. But probably better than 70% of the time we found them on the first stop. Question, Bye. Question on your pan optics. So you were using the, uh, so I have the uh, live scan online. Um, live scope? Yeah, yeah. So we okay. had live scope on last year. No but uh, so on this one, would you be using the perspective mode on that then, flipping it up to that versus the straight ahead? This is actually looking straight down. Okay, so like on the live scope, then you can flip it into the perspective mode. Yeah, you can look straight down with it. In salt water, you're only going to get about 120 feet on life scope. You have uh, the LVS 34 or 32? Uh, 34. So last year or this year? Oh, uh, last year. So, so you have the 32. Yeah. yeah. So. The new and the LVS 34 cleaned up the picture a lot. Um, you know, pretty much the same features, but it's just a lot more uh, brighter and crisper screen. So. But, um, when you're I don't even have my sonar on when I'm running. <coughs> yeah. One of the things, Charles talked about safety. There's, when I ran charter, I am ultra, ultra paranoid about offshore safety. I don't do char I haven't done charters for almost 10 years. I still do a safety talk in the morning. It doesn't matter if it's friend my friends that are fishing with me. We still do a safety talk in the morning. And when we run offshore, I have my navigation chart. Unfortunately, I have to have two big screens. And one of them's going to be on navigation, one's going to be on radar. And my radar is going to be spinning even on a bright sunny day. I don't know how many times I've ran offshore in a bright sunny day and all of a sudden ran into a fog map. But the other reason I do that is I want to get used to what I see on radar. Oh, that's what that looks like. That's what that looks like. So that way when I am in that situation, I'm comfortable with what I'm seeing on my radar. Okay? I made Tread, a few years ago we filmed the episode with Tread Barton. I made this cameraman wear a life jacket. Nice inflatable. We got back to the dock, Tread come over and he goes, what are you doing wearing a life jacket? And he goes, he made me wear it. It's my rule in the boat as captain, you either wear a life jacket or you don't go. When I'm running, if the ocean's calm and you want to take it off, you can take it off. But when I'm running, you have to wear it. Things happen really fast out there. A little bit different picture. Any questions on live scope, pan optics, that thing? Fish mapping? All right. Top five choices. What are the number one thing? Midwater shrimp. That has been the number one thing they eat for the last 10 years. I confirmed it with the guys in uh, Marine Sciences over here. That's the number one thing they find in their belly. You know where midwater shrimp lives? Midwater. <laughs> Anybody know how deep the midwater is? 
middle. A little more now. About 1,200 to 2,200 feet of depth. That's how deep they're going. Number one thing they eat is down there. Okay? Anchovy number two, squid number three, blue lantern fish, and a sorrel. California's a little bit different. Squid number one. Okay? There's your midwater shrimp. Okay? Squid, sorry, anchovy, blue lantern fish. California, the krill, trolling gear, stiff rods. It's hard to get guys that fish halibut with a soft tip rod that they think they can use for tuna, and they will most of the time. On a rough day offshore, a soft tip rod is going to be whipping like this, and your gear is going to be popping through the surface and not fishing very effectively, okay? Best thing to do, take that rod, which you've got in the rod holder, reach up, pull that line down, and on the back of your boat down here, whether you put it on a cleat or when you mount it, put yourself a release clip down there. Now you just lower the angle of that line coming through the water. So that way it's flat. That release clip will help, so that way you don't have to fish a stiffer rod. Okay. Link the rod for a trolling rod, doesn't matter. It's whatever you want to use. Okay. You might be using it for something else. Leverage. What's that? Leverage. And hey, there you go. Rod's a hard, hard to pull a big fish up, right? Yeah. Reels. Open face rails, large capacity. 300 yards of 40 to 65 pound. Lines, you can use mono if you want, it just needs to have a lot of capacity. I use Brave, I fish the J Brave. Good swivels. Buy a test rated swivel. Don't go to the bin and buy the El Cheapy ones by the handful. You just gotta tear those apart. Um, buy them that are test rated. Your leaders, they can be anything from 50 to 200 pounds. Some of the gear I fish has 50 to 80 pound leaders on it. I gaff those fish. Leaders that are 150 to 200, sometimes I just take the leader and just pull the fish overboard. Okay? But one of the things that I do is when I gaff that fish, I keep him on the gaff the whole time he comes over the side. I never let him off there until he's in the bleed bucket. Okay? Don't let him flop into the boat. Now you gotta chase him. Some guys fish blue cord, nothing wrong with it. I haven't fished it for a number of years. Not put it out behind the boat. Don't stop when the line goes down, fish on, reel it in, I mean just pull it in. Get you a little basket to throw the cord in on the floor. A little laundry basket or something. To keep your line from getting everywhere in the boat and you step it in. Okay. The salty planers, some guys will use those as well. It takes a pretty hefty reel to hold one of those. Okay? Pretty stout. The pull on that's the match. So. Your trolling lures, you've got everything from your Zuri's, Rapalas, Braid Runners for your diving lures, cedar plugs, plain wood cedar plug, most common. Daisy chains, your clones, saddle strands, no more, but uh, Amy lures are pretty good. Bazookers, Valley Hood, Williamson, there's a number of different manufacturers out there now for, for lures. There's your uh, Zucker feather, okay, your broom tail, Zucker, cedar plugs, like I said, plain cedar plug, probably number one cedar color of cedar plug. If you were on a budget in one or two colors, purple, black, probably second color you want. Daisy chain 
could swim through your swivel right here on your main line, and these are 10, 12 inches apart. That guy's got a hook on him. Okay? The theory is he's going to eat the, the slow poke, the weak one. So, they work pretty good. I've had days where my daisy chains were really on. Years ago when I told him, they, the daisy chains were really on and got them going. So, I've made my own. Uh, I just took the um, pink hoochies and then got a white pearl hoochie, put them together, put a 3 8 ounce or half ounce egg sinker up inside it, and then a couple of crimps. You can make them yourself. They're easy to make. And then put a single hook on the end of it down here. So, and my, it's not a double hook, I've got just a single. So, like a 10 or 12 on. So, this guy's a jet. Gonna create a bubble trail going through there. Attract fish from that. The Williamson Speed Pro or your X Wrap. The X Wraps today, the plastic build ones, you don't have to adjust those like the old metal ones. You catch a fish on the old metal ones, you'd have to adjust them and tune them again to get them to go straight. But not the new plastic ones. So. When I wrote my book, I studied and I talked to a lot of people. And I used to subscribe to the theory of using light colored lures on light days, dark colors on dark days. And one of the things I came across was a lot of guys catch fish on a certain thing and they are bound and determined they're going to fish it every time. Certain color. And I talked to a lot of guys from California, a lot of up here. Some of them were commercial fishermen. And one of the things I found is they had certain lures in their arsenal that almost always went overboard. For me, white and pink has been my number one. Number two is probably purple black. I have four colors in my bag. That's it. My gear bag, you guys remember when the Salty Dog Swap Meet started years ago over here? My wife and I were down there with a full truck and a canopy. We had two tables. I was selling gear, she was selling swim baits. And I was practically, she was practically giving swim baits away. We got down to that swap meet, $4,200 in my pocket, my truck was still full. She goes, you want a lot of crap. <laughs> At that time I had a 26 foot striker. The whole bow of that thing was tuna gear, this and that. Today, my tuna bag is one big Cabela's gear bag. That's it. Everything I fish will fit in that bag. Feels like you got three and a half feet. <laughs> wow, Lord, you're heavy. <laughs> now, that doesn't include my iron bag, which weighs about 25 pounds by itself. A little bit of guy. But I only have four colors. I only have two colors of swim bags. Okay. Spatter bars. They simulate a school of bait. The uh, plastic bars, um, the old archer bars, and the Albi bars. Oop, that's what I use. And some of them have a swivel down here where you can put a lure behind it. I've seen them where they actually, this guy has a hook on it. The only thing I don't like about the metal bars, you put them in the water, they have a tendency to tangle up. Whereas the plastic ones, you lay them over, and the water will just kind of untangle. They get untangled pretty easy, and they don't scratch your boat. So, if you're worried about the paint on your boat, these guys will scratch it pretty good. Okay. There's a lot of different, um, Canyon Runner makes spreader bars. Uh, Boone makes them. Some guys use painted fenders down under the water with a big sinker on the front of it to get it to go down. I've seen guys use chain, I've seen guys use chain on hand lines. Just a short section. Creates bubbles going through it. And then had a swivel at on the other end of it for their lure. Cheese grater. Remember the old metal one? Hook that up. Heck of a bubble trail. Big spinning gloves. 
seen daisy chains, spinning gloves, rooster tails comes off those things. It's amazing. I mean, people are pretty creative with the stuff they come up with, but they work. Some of them work. Um, trolling techniques. Keeping your lures in a V shape or a W shape. Okay? When we say V shape, if this is if this is my boat, my outside rods are going to be my farthest ones back. I may have two corner rods in the back. They're going to be just inside of that. Okay, for a V shape. Okay. Keep your gear fairly close and compact. If you put your outside rods 75 feet back and maybe these two rods here clear to 30 feet, you're too far apart. You want, you want doubles, triples, quads. Keep your gear close together. Okay. I don't like to run mine more than 10, 15 feet apart. I, I keep it all fairly compact. Now, that word right there has a lot to do with that. Boat attitude. Boat attitude has, deals with how the water comes off your boat. Okay. When I had a 26 striper, I had an IO. Now I have triples. The water came off my striper a lot different than it comes off this big boat. I raised my middle motor up, it's turned off. I only troll with my two motors. Okay. I get out there and bring my trim tabs all the way up. Lower both my motors down if they've been trimmed up a little bit on the right hand. And then I take off and look behind me. How's my prop wash? I want it to be clean. Okay. You, you may have a boat that you can fish 20 feet behind the boat and those fish will come right into it. Or you may have a boat that has dual props on it. And if it has dual props and you're running dual props, you're probably going to have to be farther back. One of my crew members had a big Riviera with those uh, pod drives. You couldn't catch a tuna behind that boat to save your soul. All the fish caught came pretty much off the out, off the riggers, or way back behind the boat. Okay. Most charter guys won't run a boat with those type of drives. Most charter boats have a single screw or two screws, and the harmonics of that a lot of times will raise fish right to their boat. There's a lot to that. Boat at, there's a lot to boat attitude. How many times have you ever sold a boat? And your next boat, you go, man, I never should have sold that boat. That boat caught fish. There's a lot to that. And a lot of that has to do with boat attitude. The, water, the way the water comes off your boat. So play with that a little bit. Maybe you put the lures out and you keep your pattern tight and you've got it close behind the boat. Or maybe you move the whole pattern back a little bit farther. Okay? It'll make a difference. Play with it. See where, because every boat's going to be different. See where it is on your boat. There's a sweet spot there. Trolling, um, trolling speeds varies depending on the lures. Five to eight miles an hour for most troll gear versus mile and a half to three miles an hour for swim baits. You can troll the swim baits faster. We do every now and then. Depends on the swim bait. Some of the swim baits, if they get to popping through the surface, you got to slow down just enough that they're not popping, they're, they're swimming. If they're popping through the surface, they're not going to catch fish. So, teasers off the corners or off the long riggers. Typically, I put my teasers out on my riggers. Now, a lot of you guys know John Boyer, he's in 2007, John and I decided to do an early run. So, I was doing a seminar at Sportsman's Warehouse the next day. I had my gear bag with me and he goes, why don't you fish your side of the boat? I'll fish my side of the boat. All right. I was like, I don't know if I have enough gear with me. It's like, I don't have rods. And uh, so we get out there. I put a teaser out on the rigger. And just inside of that, I had another lure in my V-shape. Bam, 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 catching fish. He's catching fish every now and then, but I'm catching like two to his one. And, uh, but the 
teaser's not catching any fish. Huh. Bring my teaser in. Uh, maybe I can get put another lure out there and maybe that lure will catch fish. I bring that teaser in, put another lure out there. My whole bite died. It's like, whoa, note to self. Teaser's attracting fish in. Even though the teaser's not getting bit, the teaser's attracting fish into the spread to my other lure. So John's like, you got another one of those things? Like, sure. So I gave him one. I put mine back out. Bam, bam, bam. My inside lure started catching fish again. He puts one out. Bam, bam, bam. It's like, huh, never should have given you that. <laughs> so just because the teaser's not catching fish, you might still be catching fish. It might still be doing its job. Okay? Let's see. And then don't troll through those cool fish. Outriggers. Do you need outriggers to tuna fish? No. My outriggers, I fly flags and different things off of them. I haven't used them in a long time. When I first got into tuna fishing, I thought you had to have outriggers. Now, there are some days out there where spread, put, spreading out that spread will make a difference and maybe help you. But for the most part, you can get away without them. So, but if you're going to fish outriggers, here's a typical setup. This is a setup, assuming you have aluminum outriggers with eyelets on them. The fiberglass ones, typically the line goes up through it and comes out the end. And in this case, you've got an eyelet here and an eyelet here, so that way you can run multiple lines off of them. Just be careful doing that. That's a great way to tangle things up on a windy day. But, so you've got your short rigger and your long rigger. Flat line. Remember that clip I was talking about down here? That's your flat line clip. Okay? And then your center line. We call that the shotgun rig a lot of times. Same thing over here. Okay? Best release, right there, knockouts. What makes it good? It's adjustable here, here, there's a little bead right in there, and that is a roller that spins. If you get that thing adjusted a little bit too snug, the line is going to go peeling through there, so it's not going to stop. Okay? These guys here work pretty good. These guys here, you've got to get people used to the tension thing is right there, and when this thing is snapped shut, it'll look like that. The problem is, if you're not the person adjusting that, every, putting that back to the same spot every time, you may get it a little too tight one time, and now the fish is peeling line off this thing, and you don't want to reach out and touch that until he's done peeling line. Because if you've got braid on there, good way to get cut. Okay? So you got to wait. My flat line clips are these guys on the end of a little small little tether, and they go on a cleat right on the back of my boat. Okay. I have used AFCO roller trollers. I'm not a big fan of them. Either this guy or the knockouts. The knockouts are $60, $60 a set. But they last a long time. So. How do you want to fish? So, you're fishing with me today. I'll ask you how you want to fish. Do we want to run offshore and try to get them going in one spot? Or do you want to run offshore and troll and have me show you how to convert that to a wide open bite? Troll caught to a wide open bite. Okay? So I, I always ask who's fishing with me, how do you want to fish today? Okay. So, if we're going to troll and try to convert that to a wide open bite, here's what that looks like. Everybody has a job, and the first thing that happens is when the first, when a rod goes off the first time, pull the throttles back. If you think you're going to keep trolling and load those rods up and convert that to a wide open bite, it's very slim you'll get that to happen. That's not saying it won't happen. 
He's on a really hot day while they're really chomping. That could probably happen. But on an average day, that's probably not going to happen. Okay? So you got to pull the throttles back. You want to be dead in the water, you want to stay close to that fish that you just hooked up. Okay? So, transition time is critical. You need to work as a team. Everybody's got a job. You're going to convert this in the first 20 to 30 seconds. Okay? Somebody, you know, some people call it the magic minute. I say it's got to happen in the first 20 to 30 seconds, or it's not going to happen most of the time. So here's what that's going to look like. You four are fishing with me. You're going to throw chum. You're going to pitch a swim bait at that fish that's hooked. Not out here, not over here. I want you to pitch it straight at it. You're not going to tangle it up. It's never happened. Don't ask me why. It's never happened. You might also pitch one. And you're going to be ready with iron. And if I have anybody else with me, when you're done chumming, I'll have you maybe grab a live bait rod. Okay? Since you guys don't have live bait up here, I might have you grab another iron rod. Okay? And since this is Newport and there's no live bait, what I might be using for chum, since I can't use live bait, I might use dead bait or I might use food grade calamari that I've gotten right out of the frozen food section, thawed it out in a bucket of water, bay water, salt water, on my way out going that morning, get out there, start fishing, chop it up into little bitty bites, little bitty quarter inch pieces. And that's what you're going to throw. There's like two handfuls of that. You're going to throw it straight back towards that fish that's hooked. Okay? Now, so here's what's going to happen. Zzz, the rod goes off. I pull the throttles back. I might even back up just a little bit to stop my forward slide. <coughs> Because even if you stop, pull the throttles back, you're still sliding. I want to stop. I want to be real close to this fish. Okay. So I pull the throttles back, maybe even a little bit reverse. Boom. You're pitching the swim bait. Boom. You're throwing some chum. I'm dealing with the gear that's in the water. Okay. I'm the deck hand. You guys are fishing. Okay. And you guys are making this happen real quick. You have those rods. Don't put your rods way up in rocket launchers that it takes you too long to get up to. Have that swim bait rod down somewhere you can get to it. So, when, it, when John and I were fishing that time offshore, we had Dylan Shore fishing with us. Every time we turned around, he was putting a swim bait rod way up high on that collar. And I struggled to get up there to get it. Pretty soon, that's laying in up in the gunnel. Dell, I'm going to beat you. You put my rod up there again. <laughs> and I was pitching it out the back and hooking them up. And uh, it was funny. He kept putting it up top. So, so that's going to happen. Everybody's got a job. So before you leave the dock in the morning, if you know that you're trolling and that you want to try to convert to wide open bite, Assign people in your boat to a job. If you know somebody's better at one thing than at something else, all right, it's your job to do swim baits. All right, I'll have my swim bait rod close. Okay. Somebody's new chum. What are we doing for chum today? Oh, okay. Where's the chum going to be? All right, okay. Okay. Get ready. Don't well, don't don't get out there and have that first rod go. Oh. We didn't think we didn't plan. Okay. One of the best bites I've ever gotten was food grade calamari. I've moored down here, I've moored Garibaldi, ran out of Garibaldi one day, fishing a writer for an article on late season tactics. All we're fishing's iron. Okay. That was back when I was still trolling. We were gonna troll to find fish, and then we're gonna convert that to wide open bite and just iron. Two little hand foods, food grade calamari, had that wide open bite going for hours. Never had to chum again. Just one fish after another on iron coming over. Out of Garibaldi. Work it for a little bit, 
If you don't get it to go right away, stay there and work a little bit. One of the biggest parts of tuna fishing is finding tuna. You hook the tuna, that means you found it. Work it a little bit. Okay? If you get them going, you're on a wide open bite, boom, the bite dies. Don't rinse the boat out. Leave that boat bloody. If you rinse that boat out, the sharks are going to show up. They may they're probably going to show up anyway, but you rinse the boat out, they're going to show up a lot sooner. Don't rinse it out. You're going to have to live it. Take a break. Maybe you put 20 fish on, 30 on. Have a sandwich. Have a drink. Take a break. Okay? Maybe you've got a swim bait rod you can throw out while you're drifting. Or maybe you have this drift going, a little bit of wind out there, and maybe you've drifted. Look on your chart bar. If you've got, if your crumb trails are turned on, maybe you've drifted. Run back up to where you got that bike started. And just go back to drifting again. And throw a little bit of chum and see if you can get them going again. You don't have to go back to trolling. We drifted a couple miles one time on a bike like that, drifted right into a really, really dirty green water. Lost our bike and died. But we had them going for a while. Ran back uphill, go right where we started, killed power, went right back to doing what we were doing, and they were right there. Bam, 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 we got them going again. Okay. We were offshore one time, had a wide open bike going on a greasy flat ocean. Lost our bike. My, I saw my buddy's boat and he's starting the engine up. He's like, what are you doing? It's like, well, we're going to have to go find some fish. It's like, we found fish. They're not biting right now. I said, we're fishing live bait. I said, just leave one overboard. Leave a clicker on. They'll let us know when they come back. So we stopped. We took a break. I said, where are you going to go? There's fish everywhere around us. I mean, they're jumping everywhere around us. It wasn't 15, 20 minutes, the rod goes off again, and we're all back to fishing. Remember what I said? They go down, they come up, they go down, they come up. Finding fish is the biggest part of it. And when you find them, stay on them. Okay? Don't leave to go find more fish. They're still there. Just keep working. Be patient. Make sure you haven't drifted a long ways. Okay? Converting the bike. Stopping immediately versus continuing to crawl. Time is everything. Okay? That swim bait we're casting back, we call that a drop back rig. Works well. It'll add 10% to your catch rate during the day. If you get that back there. I use a swim bait. You can use iron. Put it on a rod that you're good at casting. Doesn't matter what it is. Look at your sonar. <coughs> when you hooked up and you stop, look at your sonar. Are there fish below? Okay. If you're going to drop iron, you've got to get the boat stopped. You can't be drifting or sliding. Iron won't go down straight if you're sliding. Okay. So, live bait. It's always great if you have it. Chopped up herring, squid, anchovies, that uh, food grade calamari. One of the best white open bites I've ever had. Came right out of the frozen food section of the grocery store. So, works great. Commercial chum. The only bad thing about commercial chum is it can have blood in it. And the sharks are going to show up. It's just a matter of time. If you've got blood in your um, that may facilitate that to speed it up. Dead bait works pretty good. You can fish dead bait on a live bait hook, because if you're live bait fishing. We did it out of Charleston one year during the old Oregon Classic. Worked great. Popcorn. Buddy of mine threw the popcorn overboard. The birds were eating the popcorn. Fish came up to see what the birds were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.
I'm telling you, some of the feedback, the stories I get, some of the things people are trying is kind of interesting. Frisky's cat food, dry cat food work. Um, it gets a little mushy in a bloody boat, though. So. What if they're jumping and they're not biting? You need to change your gear, change your tactics. Okay? Remember I said when it gets 63, 64, 65 degrees? They'll be jumping, but they may not be biting. Just because most of them are down. If they're jumping and not biting, you could pitch swim baits, run and gun. That's a lot of fun. You work the iron. What's that? I just said I thought the running gun was missing. Three best colors. Green sardine, walleye whacker, or Channel Island Shorty for your swim baits. Walleye whacker for me is number one. And that's a um, swim bait out of California, Big Ham made by Big Hammer. And their website is swimbaits.com. Inglorine carries Big Hammer swim baits. And they do carry the walleye whacker. Okay. I used to get them from Big Hammer, now I just get what I need from Ingle Marine. Remember I told you I only have two colors in my bag of swim baits? These two. How many of you travel to Central America or Mexico fishing? Take you a bunch of those. Draw to love them. You want to have some fun on a spin rod? Throw one of those. Let, if you're on a charter boat, let them put one of those back. And find a nice Dorado on a live action spin rod. It's a hoop. All right. When you're rigging the swim bait, it doesn't matter if you have a painted jig head or not. It does matter if it has an iron. Okay? So you're going to put him right beside that, and then you're going to take that hook right there, and you're going to mark the back into the belt, or back into the back. Scratch it across the back. And now you're going to thread it, and it's going to come out like that. And if you get it the right distance, it's going to be snug right up against that. You don't need to glue it. It'll be nice and snug. Okay. If you're trolling the swim bait, it's very critical this comes out nice and even. And right in the middle. If you're pitching the swim bait, just stick it on there. Okay. It doesn't matter where it comes out if you're pitching it. But if you're trolling it, it's not going to troll you. It's not going to troll right. If it doesn't come out in the middle. I now only have one ounce and two ounce. That's all I fish. I fish a one ounce with a three and a half inch. I fish a two ounce with a five inch. When I fish fluorocarbon directly tied to the jig head, You want a cover on your lure going out. If you don't have a cover on this guy, he could be tangled up. Because if this rod tip is very soft, that boat going across the ocean with these rods up in the rocket launchers, we've seen this guy back there doing this for 40 miles, and he's wrapped around all the other rods. Yeah. And you spend 30 minutes untangling everything when you get out there. Now this guy's been used in a lot of seminars, so he's kind of manual. He's been on and off there a number of times. All right, he's not painted. He's tied straight to that head. There's the knot. Okay, to the floor carbon. So I have maybe five feet of floor carbon. You could. You swivel up here? Yeah. Or swivel on here? Yeah. I wouldn't put one here. But you could put one tied to this with a lever to it. Yeah, but you want to be tied directly to that guy. Okay. I have braid on here. Um, 30 pounds. Doesn't matter what color. That fluorocarbon is a critical part of that. 
I use a double Albright knot. This one's kind of frayed because I've tied it a couple of times. Um, but a double Albright will go right through that real easy. 30 for a pitch. You were drilling that. If that's all I was doing, yeah. Yeah. But some guys that fish it, a 9 foot, 10 foot rod, something they can launch. Here's the critical part about running a gun in swim baits that most people make a mistake on. You whip it out there, settles in the water, and you're doing this. Uh -uh. That's way too fast. Remember the article I was doing with this writer that time? One of my buddies was fishing with me. He'd never fished with me before. And these bright, white, new Grendon bits. And I said, Anthony, you run up there, grab that swim bait, and throw it at that tuna. He throws it out there, and he lets the saddle in. I said, throw it out there again. Gets his head. Doesn't punk up. I walk. I said, you're scaring the tuna with those bibs. Get down. So he gets down below the gun. Now he's pitching it out there. Still nothing. So I walk out there and say, here, get up. Let me see your rock. I said, they don't care about your bibs. You're really too fast. So pitch it out there again. I let it settle about 15 seconds. I said, you're reeling it way too fast. I said, here's how, and I just barely moved the handle, hooked it up, handed it the rod, hooked up with the fish on it. So, didn't care about the bibs. They were right. <laughs> Fresh out of the package. So, but yeah, so that, the key is reeling slow. Slow, slow, slow. And if you're fishing and you're dead in the water, pitch a swim bait upwind and stick it in a rocket launcher. You'd be amazed how often a swim a fish will come by and take that. Oh, another one hooked up. Okay. Oh, so now remember I'm about that. Alright. So if you're going to troll them, 75 to 150 feet back. Anywhere from one and a half to seven. The key is making sure they're swimming. Go as fast as you want until the point they're skipping. And then slow down slightly where they're swimming. You're good. Okay. Retrieve slow on a pitched one. And then drift them while you're dead in the water. Okay. Working the iron. How many of you guys have worked iron? All right. Working the iron. This is a lead jig that's painted. And I'm going to show you a number of different types of iron. And I'm going to condense it all down for you. Okay. We have high speed yo yo jigging, which is what most people think of. And then we have slow pitch jigging, which recently came out in the last couple of years, which is also new. High pitch jigging and casting. Casting, not any different than casting this one thing. Pitch it out there and let it settle. Flutter. All right? It takes different rod and reels to make them work, to do different things. You need a parabolic rod that flexes from the tip to the butt. Remember you somebody mentioned the great big long rod for leverage? This is a jigging rod. And one of the things that makes this rod very unique is its parabolic action. And if you're fishing a rod, of any length that shuts off or doesn't flex very much and you're fishing tuna, you're, your back is going to be hurting so bad at the end of the day. All right. Hold that jig for me. Watch the hook. All right. Hang on to it now. All right, so I'm gonna, bit, I'm gonna lift this rock. What I want you to look at is I want you to look at how this rod bends and where it shuts off. Okay? 
It doesn't, does it? No. Yeah, all the way down into here. Okay? That's why I have a clamp on it, because this will come loose if you don't have a clamp on it. Because the rod is flexible. So when, oh, go ahead, thanks. So when we talk about a parabolic rod, that's what we're talking about. If you have a rod that shuts off halfway out here, your back is going to be paying the price at the end of the day. Rod that shuts off right here, or doesn't shut off, your leverage is clear up here, close to you. Okay. That's also the significance of how it makes this jig work, is the fact this rod flexes, the whole thing flexes when you're working this jig. The writer who came to do the article, he brought a salmon rod with him, had a lure tied to it. We are working them over on iron. I mean, we just, I had four guys on board, and all four of them are all hooked up all the time. He said, do you mind if I try the salmon rod? He's like, sure, no problem. He couldn't, he couldn't get it to go to save his soul. I said, I have extra rods up there, just grab one of mine. All right, so he does. Pretty soon it's like, do you mind if I try your salmon, put one of my lures on your salmon rod? No. So I tried that, still couldn't get it to go. Okay, it was interesting. I took his lure off, put it on one of my rods. We're great. So the rod and the reel are a big part of what makes it work. Okay, you have to invest in the rod and the reel if you're going to fish iron. There's no getting around it. Okay, you need a parabolic rod. Most of these parabolic rods, this is a Daiwa Saltiga rod. And most of these parabolic rods are going to be about 5'10 to about 6'6 in length. Okay, Shimano came out with their with their ter uh, their system, and Daiwa came out with their system, and the rods are similar. Now I can tell you this: I've never broken one of these rods. They are tough. I've taken them to Panama and pulled on 150 pound grouper with them, and just it was me and tug of war. I mean, they're tough. You can fish this rod for bottom fish. You can use it for a lot of things. You can fish this rod for helmet if you want to. It's got the leverage and the, and the power to do it. Okay. No, it's a composite. So. so I've got a high speed reel. But more importantly, I have a reel that brings in 42 to 40 inches of line per crank. Okay. You notice that this reel is narrow and tall. Okay. Your jig reels are made that way. They're narrow, they're tall. They'll bring you in a lot of line per crank. Minimum 42 inches. Okay, 42 to 40 inches is what you want for a jig reel. Okay. That's more important than being high speed. Because you just have high speed and it still may only be bringing in 35 inches of line or something like that. Okay? The narrow and the tall part of it is what brings all that extra line. Okay? 200, 250 yards of line. You don't, you don't need an awful lot of line. I've never been spool jigging. I've had them make a few pretty good runs, but I've never been spooled. I think I have 200 yards of, of uh, 50 or 65 pound braid over here. And you're fine. And then there's my knot. I have a double all right again. Something nice and smooth, low profile, that'll go through that. If you have a double all right that fails, it's because you didn't get the knot really, really tightened up. Okay. Knot works great. So, high speed jigging. We're dropping the jig down into the zone where we believe the fish is, and a lot of people will count second. And they'll figure out, on the sonar, they'll figure out how long it takes to get to a certain depth for a certain lure. Okay? So here's what that's going to look like when you guys. High speed yo yo. Okay? You work in the rod, and you only want to move it, you only need to move it about this much. Now you're going to add reeling. 
That's high speed yo-yo jigging. Some days they don't want it that fast. So remember I told you I've got two ladies on board my boat that are really, really good at iron. Megan, drop it down to 75, bring it back about half speed. Wedding, drop it down to 50, bring it back at fast high speed. I bet in the last six, seven years, that medium speed has caught most of the fish, not the high speed. That medium retrieve, okay? This jig, you notice, has hooks on the top, nothing on the bottom, okay? They will take it on the drop, not as often as they're gonna take it on the upside. The reason the hooks are up on top is because working this, and this jig's going to come up, and every time you lift the rod, it's going to dart. And the direction is going to dart. It's going to be darting head first because it's tied to the leader right there. And then you're going to dart it again head first, again, and again, each time you lift and crank. And they're going to take it as it's coming to them. Okay? That's why the hooks are on top. High speed yo yo jig. Okay. The jigs are a little bit different. They're narrower. Okay. What color is it? Pink. Okay. The one thing I want you to remember pink is a very dominant color with tuna fish. 90% of the iron in my jig box is pink or some combination of pink. Okay. And it makes a difference. So that's high speed. Narrow reel, 42 to 48 inches line. Assist hooks on the top. Normally they'll take it on the jig. How heavy of jigs do you need? 110 to 140 grams. Unless you're willing to fish on a really rough day, you don't need more than 140. Okay? out there on the Gulf Stream in North Carolina fishing the Giants. That Gulf Stream moves so fast, we fish 750 grams. I mean, it is flying. All right. Slow pitch. Doing less to get more. The difference between a slow pitch and a regular jigging is how the lure behaves. See the hooks up on top? See the hooks on the bottom? Very little movement by the angler. It won't tire you out near the back. And a little bit longer parabolic rod, sometimes it's better. But you can get away with the same jig rod. You don't have to have another jig rod. Okay? Sure. Same reels. Okay? The Nomad Buffalo, I fished the Nomads, I fished the Daiwa SK jigs, and Gamagatsu has some new ones out, Seaforce, that look really good that I'm going to fish a little bit this year and try for them, since I'm sponsored by Gamagatsu a little bit. Slow pitch, using a jig that's got hooks on both ends, you're going to drop the jig down into the zone you believe the fish are, and then you're going to bring the rod back to drag off. You're going to bring the rod up from about down here to about right here. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. Bring the rod up and about half a crank. The jig's going to come up. Now you're going to drop it. And now the jig's going to flutter and go the other way. Okay. So when you lift this rod, the, jig, the head of the jig, the top of the jig, is going to go this way. When you drop this thing, the tail end of the jig is going to go this way. They're going to take it on the leading edge, whichever one is coming to them. So if they're taking it on the upswing, they're going to take it on the top of the jig. If they're taking it on a the drop, they're taking it on the bottom of the jig. That's why there's hooks on both ends. 
Do you need two hooks on both ends? Not necessarily. Some guys will fish with one hook on each end. Okay. It's not a lot of movement. About every, about every five seconds. You can do that all day, can't you? Okay. The slow pitch jigs typically are a little bit different shape. They're fat. This is the biggest thing. Okay. These guys here. Hooks on both ends. It's more of a finesse than it is anything else when getting onto it. And after the jig comes up, what you believe might be out of the strike zone, just drop it right back down into the strike zone. Okay? So you can do slow pitch, or you can do the yo yo jig. Okay? But remember, I told you that most of this yo yo jigging has been not real fast the last few years. Medium action is, has done it, has been the work. There's the Saltiga Daiwa SK jigs, Shimano's. This is the number one lure I've here used for Shimano. The Hammer Diamond jig's been around forever. We need some Vortex. The Nomad Buffalo Jigs. See how that rod is loaded up? Okay. You're not going to break it. Sure looks like it. You put that on there, put it on with a split ring. 5.5 to 6 owner split ring. Solid ring, a 5.5 to 6. Put it right up there. And then put your assist hook on it. Okay. Same thing on the bottom. I use the Gamagatsu 510 assist, it's the 2 lot. If you want to make your own, get the, um, the red or the orange uh, 400 pound parachute cord off Amazon. Cut it into 9 inch length, put a half inch on it, take it up through there, pull it up tight, and then get you some 3 16 shrink tube, electrical shrink tube, cut about an inch of it, Run it down on there, shrink it on there, it won't come loose. Okay. Live bait. I'll cover this real quick for anybody that gets into it. So, typically you want to match the hook on a live bait hook. You want to match it to the bait that you're fishing. So if you're fishing a dead bait here, most of those dead baits are going to be an anchovy, a frozen one. See the hook? Barely. That's a number two. Not a two lock, a number two. So you want to match the hook to the bait. Fluorocarbon tied straight onto it. And eight feet of fluorocarbon typically will get you plenty. I have a little bit more on here. But um, I like a seven foot six rod. Not seven, not eight, not nine. Let me tell you why. Because when I drop a live bait overboard, the seven foot rod that is short enough that bait tends to come back under the boat. Eight foot rod or beyond, yeah, you get the bait out away from the boat, but now you're trying to land the fish and you've got this great big long rod. And you're trying to get the tuna close to the boat. And you're fighting that. I have found that seven foot six is a great length for live bait fishing. Okay. This is a Daiwa Proteus rod, and it also has an amazing parabolic action for when you load it up, when you're hooked up. So that's a Saltiga 20 reel. You notice it's not very big. They don't make big runs, even a big fish. 200 yards. That's 30 pound braid on there. Um, number 
two. I fish 30 pound fluorocarbon. Some people will drop down a little bit if they think the fish is finicky. I just chum them more, try to get them going more. Okay, so that way I can get away with not having to be switching around on the fluorocarbon. There's nine different methods to hook a live bait. Just hook them through the nose right there, just like this. Don't hook them from the chin up because you'll pin their mouth shut, they can't breathe. They'll die. Hook them right through the nose sideways. Okay. If you're trying to get them to dive, we used to say hook them back here in the anus to get them to go down. Screw that. Put a sinker on. You'll fiddle around trying to get them to go down. You're better off just putting a little bitty split shot three or four feet up the line here. You know, quarter ounce, three eighths. You don't want to drag them down, you want to take them down gently. Otherwise it's too hard on them. Okay? Some days they are a little bit, a little bit deeper. Then fly lining or casting the bait. Last thing you want to do is put a bait on here and then whip it overboard and sling them off there. Take a little bit of line like this with your bait and just get him going and take your thumb off the spool and just gently let cast him right log him out there. I think he's going to inhale it up to get that little hook to hook him. Yep, and it's going to hook him right on the jawbone. So, your live well, this is critical. Your live well should fill in eight minutes. If your live well fills in seven minutes, you're probably okay. They're probably going to swim faster and harder, and they may not last as long. If your live well fills in nine minutes, they will probably sur survive, but lack, lack of oxygen will be the key there. And then don't run too hard across the ocean and beat them to death after you spend all that money on it. Okay. Paint your live well blue. Like this one. It's real soothing. Anchovies suffer from stress. If that was a mackerel, you could hook him up, lob him out there, fish him all day, put him back in the live well, it'd be great tomorrow. <laughs> Not an anchovy. You're talking about a whole different thing. You got anxiety issues. <clears throat> and then your live well should be oval in shape. If it's got any corners, they're gonna congregate in those corners and they're gonna kill themselves. Okay? Then etiquette. If you see a boat dead in the water offshore out there, honestly, don't get very close to them. Remember I told you about the guy that came right by me? Stay 200 yards at a minimum away from a boat. Okay? If I'm dead in the water, go 200 yards upstream of my drift and get in my drift. Because if I'm chumming, I may have a pretty good chum trail. And there may be fish in my chum trail. Just get in the same drift I'm in. But get upstream with me. Okay? Now, I have called boats into me. Last time I did that, I called a charter boat in from Milwaukee. And he didn't throw much chum. And he was, he was from into that door. And we were fishing iron as well as live bait. And the fish were a little bit deeper. They didn't fish iron, so they weren't. They didn't get a bit. I had another charter boat about 30, 40 yards on this side of me. The only one person on there who had a fish iron, and he didn't have any chum. We drifted along. We had a pretty good wind blowing. We saw him on pan optics. Wet and Megan were whack or whacking him on iron, and pretty soon we lost our bite. Those guys left went back to trolling. We went right back uphill to where we started and just started doing it all over again, right back down to our drift. Um, and that time I didn't call anybody and I just, um, but etiquette is important out there, that you guys be nice to each other and you don't get too close to each other. Um, remember what I said about gaffing them and I'm leaving them on the hook the whole time I bring them over the side? I had a buddy who said, well, I've been netting my fish. Because my boat doesn't get his blood. We filmed an episode of, with Tread Barter with him. It's like, your boat's just as bloody as my boat. So, 
I gaff them, I bring them over the board. If it's your fish, you're coming with me to the bleak bucket. I do not let him off here until I've taken the hook out of him, until I've cut his gills. Now he'll come off there. I'll grab him by the tail, I'll lower his head down the bleak bucket, and first. Okay. Don't sling him into the boat. Don't gaff him and bring him into the boat and let him flop on the floor, because then you got to chase him. Okay. And when you're in a wide open bite, getting that bait or whatever you have back up in the water is really critical to keep that bite going. So, and then put them on ice. Some guys like to put them in a slurry. I don't like to put them in a slurry when I'm bleeding. I bleed them in an empty bleed bucket, okay, that doesn't have a drain to it. Mine's a 50 gallon garbage can. I don't want to drain it out and put in blood in the water while I'm dead in the water. Otherwise, it's going to attract the sharks way too fast, okay. So, head first, bleed them out, and you want to get them bled out pretty good because the heat of the battle, their body temperature can climb to an average of 85 degrees. Now I put them in a slurry in my fish box. I use a slurry up there, okay? And sometimes I don't offload them until the next day. I don't cut my own tuna. I typically hire it done in one of the services. And a lot of times I'll leave them overnight. So I might be salmon fishing the next day with these guys up there. Cut them in the pack, toil fan, bring spike them if you need to to stop them from shaking. Um, fish kill bags versus coolers, doesn't matter, but if you have coolers in your boat, make sure they don't have wheels on them. If they do, you've got them tied to the boat, because if you've got swell going on, they can roll the other side of the boat and put too much weight on one side. That, remember Charles was talking about bar crossings? That's a bar crossing in Adams, North Carolina. Wicked. All right. How many of you have one of these? Was it worth it? Was it worth it? I wrote this book a few years ago. It starts out with a story how I got into tuna fishing. Ends with a story on giant bluefin tuna fishing, one of our trips to out to Harris. But it's got about 170 pages of what you just looked, heard today, plus a lot more. Uh, probably next year I'll have another edition come out updated on some of the slow pitch stuff and um, fish mapping, some of the other stuff that's recent. You know, so there'll be another edition come out. We're going to give some of those away. If you've already got one of those you want to sign it, be glad to sign it. If you don't get one and you want one, you can go to my website, which is tunadogoffshore.com, and you can order one off of there. I'll sign it for you and ship it to you. Or you can go to Amazon and buy it. So they are on Amazon, but um, you may have any questions. No, they'll still bleed. I tend to prefer them head first down because I've cut them in the head and blood's going to run down their body. Yep. Yeah, they're still, still pumping. Yeah. Yeah, I let them sit in there for about 10 minutes. Question is, I've heard that the larger fish can take colder water a little better. Good correct? point, good point. Late in the season, what did I tell you, the number one thing? Food. Food, remember that, food. Late in the season, one of the best bites we ever got came in 57 degree water and in green water. We were headed out of El Waco, we were running to a spot, saw a jumper in dirty green water, pitched a swim bait to it, got him going, just kind of, it was wide open, but it was steady. We put seven and three on the boat and that spot ran out of ice. 57 degree water. They will move into cooler water for food, they'll acclimate to that water. 
Okay? If they have to find the food and it's not there, they will move into cooler water. Don't be surprised to see them. You might, another question? Yeah, you said you uh, got a hole in your garbage can, you're bleeding them in the air without water, so you just let the blood go out and you don't want to feed the sharks. No, I don't have a hole in it. You don't have a hole? I do not. But then, so you, when you're ready to go, you just stop yeah. the blood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Does blood turn off to it? What's that? Does blood turn off to it? Yeah, I haven't had that issue because I've never had that much blood go in the water while I've had a wide open bike going. I suppose it could. We have a lot of sharks out here. And, yeah, when you start getting a lot of sharks around your boat, the tuna will get real spooky and you, you'll lose your bite a lot of times. Then you, then you have to move. You don't have a choice. I just thought it was Slaughter and get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Question in the back. So on a wide open bite, you always want to leave one fish in the water fighting or no. On a wide open bite, get them in the boat. Yeah. Keep keep that stuff going. Okay? Some guys like the hanging to them. I don't like to do that. Most of the time we have had to do something like that, and I have never really found that to really benefit. Early on, when I was starting to tuna fish, I tried it. And never, what's that? Good question. When you convert the bite from a troll caught to, remember I told you I'm the deck hand, so I'm going to clear the other gear. So I'm going to clear the other gear. I am going to leave that tuna hang while I clear that gear. And then I'm going to reel him in. Okay? Regardless if you if you guys have hooked up or not, I'm still going to bring him in. Okay? Good question. No. No more questions? All right. Thanks for being patient.